Well, thank you, Dave. I just want to say thank you to you all for yeah, a welcome. And it's a real privilege, to be honest, to be here this evening. Um, I've got to know Rob quite well over the last couple of years. And yeah, to share the stage with Rob and yourself, that's what's been a real, real, yeah, real pleasure. So first of all, what I, what I thought I'd do uh, is quickly introduce myself. So um, yeah, this strange accent that you're hearing now, this is the north of England, okay? I'm in the north of England, I'm biased, but that's the best part of England, okay? So I, I come from a place just outside of um, Liverpool. So that's my kind of, yeah, this is this accent. I spend a long time in London as well. Um, so currently I wear a few hats, actually. I'm actually a PhD candidate at the University of Aberdeen. And my topic and, and thesis is looking at how the church in the UK has engaged, the evangelical church, engages with the issue of abortion. So that's my kind of uh, doctrinal work. Uh, I'm also a lecturer at the Brisbane School of Theology. I lecture in Christian worldview, uh, apologetics, uh, Christian ethics, and next semester, bioethics. But yeah, my why I'm here tonight and my nine to five, if you like, is heading up a, an organization called Cherish Life. That should be a picture of the March for Life. So I don't know who's got in and changed it already. So is that you, Dave? Um, but anyway, that should be a picture of the March for Life. Um, Cherish Life, for those you who don't know, was um, founded in 1970. So it's over, it's nearly, yeah, over 50 years old. It's one of Australia's uh, first pro-life pro organisations and still one of the largest in terms of supporters today. And our goal at Cherish Life is very simple. We want to do two things. Number one, we want to educate all people on pro-life issues. And number two, we want to advocate on behalf of our supporters for the rights of the unborn, to promote the rights of the unborn. Now, I arrived in Queensland uh, with my beautiful wife, who sat here, Mel, um, in the last week of September 2022. And I began my role at Cherish Life in the first week of October. And at this point, I had very little, to be honest, I had very little knowledge of the current political landscape, particularly concerning the issue of abortion in Australia. So I thought, look, I've took this role. The Probably the best thing to do, the first thing I need to do is actually look at the current abortion law in Queensland. Now, in the UK, since 1967, abortion has been legal only up to 24 weeks, so up to six months. That's since 1967. In most European countries, that limit is actually lower. For instance, in Spain and France, abortion is legal up to 14 weeks, just over three months, with exceptions uh, in emergency cases. So again, I thought I'd better check the laws uh, in Queensland. And guys, when I, when I, what I learned, I was horrified, to be honest. Since 2018, it is, it is legal to have an abortion up to birth in Queensland. To be clear, Unlike Queensland, um, unlike Europe, sorry, Queensland has the same abortion laws as some of those really progressive countries like North Korea and China. Okay. So I began my role in October and just a month later, I received a request to help promote uh, submissions for a Senate bill. A bill that was introduced by Queensland Senator Matt Canavan, South Australian Senator Alex Antic, and Senator for Victoria, Ralph Babette. The bill addressed the issues concerning the human rights of babies who had survived abortion procedures, but were denied the same level of medical care that any other Australian baby would receive. Folks, I'll be honest, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I couldn't believe it. And what I wanna do for the remaining time that we have is quickly run through the history of these bills uh, in Australia to provide some greater context for where we are today. And then what I'll do, I'll make some final comments on where we're currently at and where we want to go. On June the 17th, 2016, Dr. Mark Robinson, who's just recently stepped down, Mark's an absolute hero. Um, yeah, he's the member for uh, Queensland Parliament seat for Udugaru, is it? That's the one, Udugaru, sorry. Put my teeth in. Cleveland, I've heard it's also called, okay. 
He asked a question on notice concerning the number of babies who survived late-term abortions in Queensland. Between 2005 and 2015, that number was 204 babies. So this has been taking place, what's interesting, for nearly 20 years now, to be honest. In August 2021, George Christensen, the then federal member for Dawson, introduced the Human Rights Children Born Alive Act uh, bill in 2021. However, tragically, this bill was effectively shut down by the then Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, a professing Christian. In his letter uh, to Christensen, Morrison wrote or put his signature to, however you want to look at it, the following statement. We will continue to work with states and territories on the availability of safe and legal abortion uh, Australia-wide. As mentioned earlier, after Christensen's bill, um, just over a year later, in November 2022, again, another, a Babies Born Alive bill was introduced by the Senate, again by Senators Canavan, Alex Antic and Ralph Babette. And in the June of the following year, 2023, pro-life organisations such as ourselves were in, invited uh, to a public hearing in Canberra to discuss the issue. In August of 2023, the committee's report was released and its concluding remarks were this. Noting the diverse and strongly held views and that this is a matter of conscience, the committee makes no recommendations. So despite dissenting remarks from Canavan, Antic and Babette, this lack of recommendations from, a from the committee as a whole effectively rendered the bill to dead in the water, ultimately. So that's where we were. But on October the 6th, 2023, something remarkable happened quietly and without any public notification. Queensland Health amended its guidelines regarding the duty of care that healthcare practitioners should provide in cases where babies are born alive after an abortion. Previously, the guidelines stated that if a live birth occurred following an abortion, healthcare practitioners were told or instructed, do not provide life-sustaining treatments, e.g. gastric tubes, IV lines, and oxygen therapy. The updated uh, guidelines specified that in the event a baby shows signs of life following an abortion procedure, healthcare practitioners are to provide care appropriate to the individual clinical circumstances and in accordance with best practice guidelines. That may not seem like an improvement, but it is. <laughs> you know, it's a little improvement. What that means there is that now healthcare practitioners now had a level of autonomy to provide the best suitable care for these babies. So this was a significant encouragement for the movement. And it demonstrated actually the power of public exposure that resulted actually from the Senate bill just months previously. It shows the power of that. And although the bill, again, may have been silenced, the, the issue again gained visibility. However, it's important to note, and this is important, this change was only a guideline amendment, not a legislative mandate. That's important. Because it means this, just as quickly as the guidelines were amended, they could just as quickly be reversed. Okay? Therefore, that's why it remains critical to seek a legal resolution to this issue. So there was a period of silence following this change in October. Um, but then on March the 20th, 2024, Robbie Catter, the member of Parliament for Traeger and leader of the Catter's Australian Party, introduced the Termination of Pregnancy Live Births Bill 2024 into the Queensland State Parliament. This bill has become widely known as the Queensland Babies Born Alive Bill or the Catter's Bill. So what this means is there's currently right now two babies born alive bills, one in the Senate and one in the Queensland State Parliament. Okay, And this is important because there's been some confusion over this because there's been a lot of exposure about the bills, but people are confused that they don't actually know there's two. They think there's just one bill. 
So I just want to just want to add a bit of clarity there for you. Public submissions were for the Caterpill closed on May the 13th, with Cherish Life and others like ACL playing a significant role in mobilising over 600 individuals to participate. We were very uh, encouraged by the response that we had from our supporters. Um, but I'd also like to highlight the remarkable work of Joanna Howe, Dr. Joanna Howe, who has been really supportive of, of Cherish Life and you know, worked together with me and Rob, uh, helping this bill to, to progress and, and get the momentum that it needs and deserves. But the next milestone for the bill was a public hearing, which was scheduled for June the 10th. However, news of its postponement at the end of May without a new date uh, being set, started to raise concerns that this was going to be another deliberate attempt to stall the bill. And as a standard parliamentary process, uh, there needs to be a, a public hearing before there can even be a vote. So this is crucial. And it was committee um, chair, Mr. Aaron Harper, Labour MP for Thurungoa, who made, to, made the decision to postpone the bill without any explanation. Again, all, all of this, once again prompted a, a immediate response from our supporters, and it was their outcry that led to a rapid rescheduling of the hearing um, in August, on August the 19th. And again, look, I'll say it again, just to encourage you, these mini wins here underscore the power of the public voice and the collective action. This is what we've seen, to be honest, throughout this process, um, and we couldn't have got here, I want you to know, without our supporters, and it's important that you guys know that. So the hearing was scheduled for August the 19th. Um, Cherish Life, along with other pro-life advocates, uh, Rob was there and Louise, I'll come to in a minute, um, we took part in this, in this public hearing. The hearing lasted for over two hours um, and again included contributions for, for those who also opposed the bill. However, the most dramatic moment of the hearing was the powerful and emotional testimony from Queensland uh, midwife Louise Adset and Louise is here with us today. I didn't even know you were going to be here. Oh, Louise is here. <laughs> Don't start crying, Louise, or I'll start crying, okay? So I'm not going to look at you. But anyway, Louise spoke about her experience as a midwife. <laughs> Witnessing babies being born alive uh, following abortion procedures. She told actually of a harrowing story of a baby boy who survived an abortion weighing over 400 grams, a healthy weight. His parents did not wish to see him or hold him. And this baby fought for his life for over five hours before taking his final breath. Not only did this boy die in a Queensland funded hospital, but he was also denied the legislative right to the same level of medical care as any other Queensland baby. And if it were not, listen, for the dedication of some of the extraordinary midwives, like Louise, that baby would have been left to die alone. This is why this bill is critical, okay? And what can be described as a dramatic turn of events the very next day, on Tuesday the 20th of August, Senator Ralph Babette, again, one of the three uh, Queensland senators who introduced the bill two years earlier, if you remember, he sought to revive his bill. Being moved by Louise's testimony at the Queensland hearing, he called for an urgent motion for a vote on the Senate bill. Again, a remarkable attempt to resurrect a bill that many had considered to have been dead. And following some passionate speeches in the Senate chamber, the vote took place. In the end, 32 senators voted against the motion. 26 uh, senators did not vote, and 18 senators voted in favour. And friends, listen, those voting records, and Rob taught me this, he always says the record's online. And listen, the record's online, okay? Um, exactly for those who didn't vote and for those who voted against. But look, I want to just note as well, um, Senator Alex Antic, who put forward the bill, he had a valid reason for not voting. He was in Adelaide with his wife who was giving birth, so that's one who's got a valid reason, okay? However, for the 25, uh, or 20, sorry, 26 that didn't vote, it remains unknown. We don't know why they didn't. So what's next? What's next with the bills? 
At the moment, the Senate bill is back where it started, ultimately. Um, with regards to the Queensland bill, there will be a report due by September the 20th. That could come earlier, but that's actually only next week, this time next Friday. So we're eagerly anticipating this report to see the committee's conclusions and recommendations regarding this bill. And we'll obviously let you guys know uh, as soon as we do. Now, look, it must be noted that throughout the proceedings, the main underpinning issue that those opposing the bill consistently referred to as to why it should be rejected was because, according to them, it created barriers to the abortion uh, procedure. It created barriers for women getting abortions. Friends, that's a complete lie. Yes. It's a complete lie. Correct. It's a red herring. Mm -hmm. Both bills create absolutely no barriers whatsoever to those wanting abortions. Absolutely none. Okay? All these bills are trying to do is create a legislative right to healthcare to a child who's been born alive than any other ch Australian child. That's it. There is no barriers whatsoever here. So I want to make that crystal clear because that's, you know, I, I was, we sat in the hearing and that's what you consistently hear. And it wasn't really challenged, to be honest, but that's the reality. Now, finally, I want to share something with you all, which I think is interesting. Two days ago, I thought that's where we were at. And I discovered yesterday um, that that's actually not the case in a sense. Again, incredibly, quietly and unannounced, the Queensland Termination of Pregnancy Guidelines have been revised again. Again. These new guidelines are more expansive on the live birth issue. And to be honest, I haven't, I haven't had time to properly reflect on all of them. However, they still make some incredible claims. And, and but to the, obviously, the due to the constraint time, and not to share everything. But I want to just share one. This is page 28 of the, Queensland, the new revised Queensland Guidelines for Termination of Pregnancy Abortion Guidelines. Now, granted, the image isn't too good. Um, but what I want to do, I want to focus on the updated very first line under the heading duty of care. Listen to this. The new guidelines state that once removed or expelled from a woman's uterus, a womb, and born alive, a fetus only becomes a person, in brackets, baby, and assumes legal status and rights independent of the rights of the parent. This is interesting, but very worrying. Again, they state here that a baby only becomes a person once it's been removed or expelled from the woman's uterus or womb. Folks, that is not a scientific position. That is not a biological position. That's a philosophical position in the guidelines here. And I want to provide some empirical evidence, um, evidence-based approach and an, anecd an anecdotal objection as well. First, if you go to other uh, Queensland health guidelines, not regarding abortion, but instead, let's look at the pregnancy of, um, this is the pregnancy guidelines. They have a section on fetal movements they probably have more sections, but again, I've not had a chance to have a look. In that section, the guidelines have no issue using the language of baby for a child that's in the womb. Isn't that interesting? For example, you can't see it there, but it says fetal movements reassure that the baby is well. Fetal movements may vary between pregnancies and babies. However, again, in the updated termination of pregnancy guidelines, it says a fetus only becomes a baby when they are born. This is inconsistency here for practicing midwives, as well as the cognitive dissonance from those writing these guidelines is truly mind blowing, mind blowing. They are all, all over the place with this. They're all over the place. They have changed their guidelines twice in two years. They've changed it twice in two years because of, um, ultimately, because they've been seeing what we've been doing in the Senate and in the Queensland bills. Just think about that. Theoretically, a midwife could be in one room and asked to treat the unborn as a baby. That same midwife could walk next door to the other room and be told not to treat that unborn as a baby until it's been expelled from the uterus. Crazy. That's what we're dealing with at the moment. Absolute madness. I actually feel really sorry um, for Queensland midwives. They are victims 
of anti-life ideologues and bureaucrats who are imposing their anti-life ideology upon their profession. I feel really sorry for them. The guidelines, the guidelines are evidence of this. People become midwives to save life, to bring life into the world, not to facilitate the taking of life. So that's an empirical objection. Next, a personal anecdotal objection. My wife is currently pregnant with our second child. <laughs> Stand up, Melter. I'm joking. Um, when we went for a 12-week scan, they talked to me and Mel about our baby. In Australia, they say bub, so I had to learn that one. They said, look, there's baby's heartbeat. Look, there's baby's legs. They didn't say, look, there's your fetus. No, they said, here's your baby. And they're right to say that, aren't they? Because it's true. That's my baby. It's not a baby once Mel gives birth. It's a baby now. So what's the big point I'm making here? What's the underpinning issues with these bills? The real issue is that in Queensland, we have different guidelines and laws based on whether a child is wanted or unwanted. That's the issue. And that's a tragedy. In Queensland, we discriminate against unwanted children. Inside the womb with abortions, but the Babies Born Alive bill highlights that we also discriminate against unwanted babies outside of the womb as well. Friends, wantedness, and I know that's in grammar, grammatically incorrect. I've done that purposely so you remember it. <laughs> wantedness should not determine the type of healthcare a baby receives. All right? That's it. That's the reality. In Queensland... Any child, regardless if they are wanted or unwanted, should be loved and cherished. So where do we go from here? We keep going. The way to under, undermine and weaken bad ideology is through better education. That education may not be received well, but we don't stop giving it. We keep going. Education is critical. I believe that 99% of Australians would pass this law if they were sat in those lawmaking seats, if they knew the reality of what's going on. That's the reality. They don't have the education. The issue is that they just don't know it happens or they don't believe us. <laughs> that's the issue that we're finding. So at Cherish Life, that's what we want to do. We want to help educate you so you can help educate others. Okay? We want to educate our political represent rep representatives and we also want to help educate our churches. The issues of babies being born alive and left to die, guys, is not a political issue per se. It's a theological issue with political implications. It's a spiritual issue. Wanted and unwanted babies, babies every single baby is born, is made in the image of God. That's the reality. Okay? Whether you're wanted or not doesn't change that fact of God. Again, it's not just the wanted babies who are made in God's image. And I want to encourage you, uh, us as believers, to pray for this issue, actually. Pray for the other issues on, on, again, just as important as well. Pray privately, but listen, very carefully, pray publicly as well. When you pray publicly, you're declaring to those listening that this is an issue on God's heart. Yeah. It's an issue that they should be aware of, and it's an issue that God cares about. So, look, we've, um, we have got some resources coming out. Um, we haven't got on here yet because it's not ready, but in October, we're going to release a... We're going to ask those questions, as Dave mentioned earlier, to the candidates, and we're going to ask them where they stand on third trimester abortions. So, to complement what ACL have got going on, go to ACL to find out what's, where they voted. What we want to do also is help uh, you guys vote, uh, know where your candidates stand today. So in October, we're going to contact um, all the candidates and get a response to those answers. They can answer against, for, don't know, or they can not answer. But I'll tell you this, a not answer is an answer in itself. So remember that. So, And look, we're going to be releasing that um, middle of October. Well, first, first week in October, that's the plan. But we'll let you guys know as soon as we've got it. 
But there you go. Um, if you want to know more, um, you can do so at cherishlife.org.au. I did have a video, but unfortunately we don't have audio, but that'll be coming out soon. But again, um, get involved, sign up to the newsletter and hear about what's going on. And we'll, we'll obviously educate you on what's happening with the bills as well. So thank you. God bless you. Last question, um, Matthew Cliff. Uh, what should we ask our candidates? Okay, I'm, I'm going to be really cheeky. I'm going to ask, tell you to ask two. Okay, so number one, would you support a bill to remove third trimester abortion? That's one. The second one is, would you support a bill to give children born alive after an abortion a legislative right to health care? Yeah. Very simple. For Matt. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to have the same question. I guess for midwives and that, that that sector of the industry is, you know, why are they not speaking? Why are not are they not raising up, rising up in numbers? Because they can make such a stand against the, you know, the lead, you know, the um, heads of these hospitals. Yeah. You know, and there's all these midwives that are being, you know, traumatized. Mm. Why aren't they? Working up and standing up against these, you know, principals or whatever leaders of these um, hospitals are saying, no, we're not going to do this. Like, I'll make a comment on that quickly, and I'm going to actually ask Louise if you won't mind getting because yeah, can't do it. Oh, can't do it. Okay, Sorry, no problem. Louise has got parliamentary privilege at the moment. Unless right. She wants to break that. No worries. I would suggest not do it. Okay, no problem. That's fine. No worries. I'll I'll give my best shot at that. At a top level. I'm, again, I'll just mention what I mentioned earlier. We've got to understand that these peak medical industries um, and organizations have been captured ideologically. They create, they, they create an environment that's very difficult for midwives to come forward and make statements like that, for example. So we see that not only with, you know, look at, in terms of the bill we just had, uh, the, the public hearing, we had Queensland um, Midwives Union opposing the bill against us. That gives you some idea of what the midwives are against. Um, so yeah, there you go. What about uh, the Queensland Nursing Professionals Association? Or NPA2, the other one? Uh, to, my, to my understanding, were they, 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 they at the, oh, they're good. They're good, apparently. Yeah. Well, I'll just say, I, I work with the NPAQ, and yes, we were very much. There you, there you go, fantastic, there you go. Follow up question, maybe yeah, yeah. a bit off topic, but I'm just interested in what um, Cherish Life does to sort of reach um, mothers who are considering that. That's a great question. So, look, primarily we, we deal with the educational side and the advocacy side. The supportive side, there are some fantastic organizations in Brisbane. So, the crisis pregnancy work, we support them. Um, we support them morally, obviously, and we, we want to support them more financially. That's not, we're not in that part at the moment. Um, but yeah, there are some fantastic organizations. So if someone asks, rings us up, for example, and says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a mother, I'm struggling, for example, any, whatever reason that may be, we immediately send them their way. Well.